webinar with a couple of simple questions. Uh, the first of which is, how much CO2 is, is emitted from a single plastic bottle? Uh, and what does a kilogram of CO2 look like in the first place? We always read about and hear about carbon emissions, footprint. Uh, what does it mean? What do these look like? Why should we even care about the topic if we are in supply chain? Well, today, organizational sustainability goes beyond just a healthy income statement with the environment featuring high up on any major agenda. So companies are both morally and legally required to manage carbon emissions today in order to ensure their sustainability in the future. So money alone will no longer cut it. You might be a company that's making a lot of money, but if you're hurting the environment, that's not going to be enough for you uh, into the future. So my name is Ahmad Ghanoum, and thank you for joining us. I see several names that are uh, have attended several of our older webinars, so welcome back. And... Uh, Today, it's my pleasure to walk you through this uh, webinar where we will be exploring the environmental impact of supply chains and where we'll be looking at ways to reduce our carbon footprint as, an or as organizations. This is, of course, a live webinar and you may have some questions as we go along. If so, please leave them in your uh, chat box and uh, I'll make sure to come back to them either as we go through the webinar. Otherwise, I'll make sure to attend to all your questions towards the end of the uh, session. So uh, today's webinar will be delivered in three short parts. The first, we'll be talking about CO2 emissions. We'll explain what they are, what they look like. We'll try to visualize them. Uh, in the second part, we're going to be talking about CO2 within the context of supply chains. Uh, before we get to the third part, which is going to be about different strategies we can implement to reduce uh, the footprint of your supply chains. Of course, when we talk about supply chains, it's not just your warehouses, not just your vehicles uh, or your production plants. It's talking about the entire chain from source to the consumer. So that includes your suppliers, your sub-suppliers, uh, and also moving forward uh, downstream towards your uh, customers. So with section one on uh, CO2 emissions explained, let us start you know, very quickly by trying to visualize what CO2 emissions uh, actually look like. So if I, if you look to the, towards the left of your screen, if I uh, take one gram of uh, gasoline, okay, or, or what looks like a little blob of gasoline and, and I burn that, that is going to emit plus or minus the equivalent of one gram of CO2. Uh, if you take two cups of gasoline, so that's around 400 milliliters, and you light those up, you're going to get one kilogram of CO2 uh, emissions. So you see the E over here, the E is a reference to equivalent, so CO2 equivalent, because you might have several gases, but I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, and if you look at one metric ton or one ton of carbon emissions, that's going to be uh, emitted by burning two uh, garden gallons of uh, gasoline or around 540 uh, liters. Now, again, when you run a distribution truck, when you run a warehouse, when you switch a light bulb on, all of these, this is gonna leave behind a, a carbon footprint, right, the, the, the waste. And a lot of the f gases that are released in the process are not simply CO2, but you might have other gases as methane or nitrous oxide or several of the um, CFCs, PFCs, and so on. Uh, but what we want is we want a simple unified conversion rate for all of those different uh, gases. So what we end up doing is actually uh, looking at estimates such as the ones provided where one gram or one kilogram or one ton of CO2 is going to equal one gram or one kilogram or one ton of CO2 equivalent. So what's equal to one uh, unit of carbon dioxide. Now, moving up, one gram of methane or one unit of, um, one unit of methane, that's going to uh, create harm um, that equals the harm released from 25 units of carbon uh, dioxide. So if you have a certain operation that you're implementing that releases, let's say, 10 units of methane and five units of carbon dioxide, the total equivalent is going to be uh, 250 uh, uh, plus uh, five, that's going to be 255 
grams of CO2 equivalent. Moving on to more serious gases, nitrous oxide, that's one gram or one unit of nitrous oxide is going to be the equivalent of 300 CO2 uh, units. Uh, and then you get to the FCs family, so HFCs, PFCs, uh, SFCs, NFCs, and there are many more CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, uh, that could go all the way up to 25 or 30,000 uh, units equivalent uh, of CO2. So the other thing we need to keep in mind here is uh, if you consume a product or if you drive for one kilometer, etc., what we look at is not just the activity itself or the product itself, uh, but we need to look at the product from a life cycle perspective. So, for example, if I'm talking about the carbon emissions from a plastic bottle, that's going to have to include the emissions released uh, from mining the plastic to producing, manufacturing the bottle, shipping the bottle to the consumer, um, utilizing the bottle, and then even uh, managing the waste that results from the bottle. And you have to calculate the CO2 emissions from the entire life cycle, and that's going to give you uh, uh you know the, the more uh realistic estimate of the emissions now let's look at some examples okay the footprint of some uh, everyday uh, items that we use so a reusable supermarket bag the, the type that you pick up at the supermarket would emit plus or minus 50 grams of uh, co2 equivalent uh, a disposable diaper that's 145 grams a single bottle of water of 500 grams that goes up to 160 gram. Remember, that's from from uh, from the birth of the product all the way till its uh, uh, treatment as, as as a waste product. Uh, if you enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning, your cappuccino is costing the earth 236 grams of CO2 equivalent. Uh, one kilogram of cement goes as, again. It's a it's a it's a lot of emissions there. 710 grams. Your cheeseburger, 2.5, uh, obviously that includes beef, and beef has a much higher footprint than, than other sources of protein, that, such as beans, etc., because it consumes more water, uh, it consumes more minerals, uh, and more plants to actually produce. Uh, a dozen of eggs, again, that's going to cost 3.6. Now, the idea here is just to give, give you an idea of what the carbon footprint looks like. It's just to give you a sense of what we are talking about when it comes to CO2. Uh, emissions. So that's what they actually look like. Now, when you look at your typical uh, supply chain, obviously, uh, like I said, uh, mentioned earlier in my previous webinars, a supply chain, you cannot be sitting, you know, on the fifth floor of your office building over here and claiming that you are in supply chain with the door closed. A supply chain Im implies that you are managing the entire supply stream from the farms or the mines or the ocean on the left side all the way to the consumer on the uh, right side. So, and within those, you have a lot of different uh, operations that are releasing carbons, such as, you know, everything from planning. So if you're seeing it at an office, you have the AC on, you have the lights on, you have, you're using paper, you're using a laptop, all of that has a carbon footprint. Through purchasing and the items that you acquire, uh, and of course, transportation, uh, that's why today you have a big uh, trend towards uh, electric vehicles, you have a trend towards carpooling, you have a, a trend uh, towards optimizing your route network, it's all to keep your, those uh, down. Warehouses cost, of course, uh, an arm and a leg to operate, in, both in terms of cost and in terms of the environment. Your manufacturing plant obviously is another source, and the inventory that you have at the warehouse or in transit will also uh, leave a huge footprint. So that's why we're talking about uh, the impact of, of, of our operations on, or the, rather the impact of supply chains on, on the environment, because as you can see, it's a pretty intensive uh, operation that, uh, that supply chains uh, run through. Now, what are some of the strategies, that's the, the, you know, the heart of the webinar, what are some of the strategies that we can do to actually reduce the amount of carbon dioxide uh, emissions? We're gonna look at the classic waste permit, okay? And so here we're gonna look at six different ways for dealing with waste. So the first, the top of the pyramid is going to provide us with the most preferred option and the, the lower down you get, the least preferred the options become. And the idea is the best way to reduce your carbon emissions is to avoid uh, using a certain product or to avoid uh, doing a certain 
activity. Okay, so if you can, I'll, I'll walk you through an example uh, later on, but the simple example is if I want to buy a plastic bottle of water for drinking purposes, I can avoid the plastic by drinking, you know, from tap water or, or filtered uh, water. Now, if you cannot avoid, the next best thing would be to actually reduce the amount of items that we're actually consuming uh, in supply chain. It could be reducing the amount of uh, uh, raw ingredients it could be, or raw materials. It could be reducing the distance traveled uh, when it comes to your fleet. It could be reducing the warehousing space occupied. All of these will leave a... Uh, Will, will generate savings, okay? Avoidance uh, savings, which are the good type of uh, savings as opposed to reduction uh, savings. Now, the other thing we can do, strategy number three, is to reuse a certain item. So again, instead of using a, a, a single use uh, product, use an item that can be used over and over again, such as a, a glass bottle of water. Next comes recycling. So recycling is actually the fourth best option, uh, ironically, it is the most advertised and, the, and the, it's, it's the option that's pushed at us the most. Uh, uh, sadly, campaigns, awareness campaigns should be focused on avoidance and, re and reduction rather than recycling because recycling still leaves a big footprint in its wake because what you're doing is that you are, uh, you still have to collect the items and there's a lot of reverse logistics involved. So you have to ship the item back to a factory, so shipping, leaves a, a footprint after that you're going to process it again so there's manufacturing which leaves a footprint and then you have to ship it back to your customer via one or two layers or, or even more layers of uh, of warehousing uh, recovery is the next option to look at uh, so recovery let's say you have a mobile phone that's come to the end of its life rather than throwing the whole thing in the in the garbage or into a landfill what you can do is you can recover certain uh, what we call rare earth metals or, or you know, items, uh, small grammages of, of gold or platinum from the mobile that can be then uh, recycled or uh, reused. Some items, unfortunately, they just have to be disposed of in a uh, responsible landfill. Of course, nowadays we try to generate, you know, the, the, the methane or various gases from the landfill that we can uh, benefit from, but still that's going to be at the bottom of our uh, pyramid. Now, Let's look at uh, some of the uh, alternatives. Okay, what happens when we go for one of these alternatives to uh, recycling? So let's take a simple example, okay? And then you can scale it up depending on what industry you work in. Let's say you go to a supermarket and you purchase 15 different items. Now, the most or the least responsible thing to do would be to pack these items in two, three or more different bags. A lot of us have the, the habit of packing all our groceries or vegetables in one bag. We put the dairy products in another bag. We put meat products in a third bag. So this is what I call binge, okay, use of supermarket bags. Now, we saw earlier that the bag emits 50 grams of carbon emissions. So let's say the 15 items are packed into three different bags of, from virgin material, mind you, not, not recycled material. That is going to leave a footprint of 150 grams of CO2 equivalent. Now that's a lot of uh, emissions. So what can we do to reduce that? Uh, the first thing is we can use recycled bags instead of virgin bags. Over here, the focus was on virgin material. Now we're looking at recycled uh, material. And that can actually cut down the emissions from 150 grams down to 105 grams, which is still you know, a considerable amount of uh, carbon considering you'll barely use that plastic bag uh, for more than 10 minutes, which is the drive from the supermarket to your home. Uh, what we can do is we can actually uh, reuse bags. So if you go to a supermarket and you, and you grab a couple of bags, the next time you go to that same store, why don't you use those same bags? You know, they might, they might uh, not be, you know, look like they're fresh off the press, but they're still functional. So if I use the same three bags on two different occasions, that's already cutting the 150 in half. So that will give me 75 grams. If you use them on three occasions, that's going to give me, again, 50 uh, grams. The more reuse, the higher the savings that are going to be involved. Mind you, any saving in um, carbon emissions 
should be met with a saving in financials. So instead of using, uh, you know, nine bags in total here, in this case, I'm using three bags in total and three bags cost less than nine and they leave a better, imp a lower impact on the uh, environment. So the environment, environmental savings and cash savings or, or financial savings should not be regarded as mutually exclusive, rather than they can, they can coexist. Uh, moving on from reuse, uh, reduce, okay, if I pack, or if I squeeze the 15 items into one bag instead of three, that brings me down to 50 grams, okay? Uh, so having your bread and your apples and your, uh, you know, toothpaste in one bag is unlikely to, to cause any disturbance to the product itself or to the quality of the product. So why not squeeze everything into one bag and save the 100 grams of carbon emissions on the environment? The last thing you can do is use no bags at all, of course, and that's the best option, and that will give you zero grams. Now, it might not be practical to walk around with 15 items. If you're limited to, you know, if you have three or four items, you might be able to do that. If you go beyond that, one thing you can do is carry a, a, a more robust, reusable bag that you always take to the supermarket, or a backpack, or, or some other kind of uh, item that can be reused uh, over and over and over uh, again. Uh, if supermarkets get rid of uh, supermarket bags, people will still find a way to get their groceries uh, home. So the idea is here we've provided a simple example of how you can go down from 150 grams all the way down to zero when it comes to supermarket bags. Uh, I would like to ask you to think about how you can use the same principles at your companies to reduce the carbon emissions, not of just the products that you that you use, but also of the vehicles and the uh, whether it's for passengers or goods, the warehouses, the offices, uh, and so on. Now, I mentioned earlier that again, the uh, financial gains and the environmental gains can coexist. And I'm going to provide you here with a simple uh, example of how that works. Uh, I'm going to go back to the classical example from uh, McDonald's. Uh, some of you remember the styrofoam uh, clamshell uh, packaging on the on the left. Uh, today we no longer see that, of course. We we see the carbon uh, packaging, which is not only more uh, environmentally friendly, but it's also uh, financially makes more uh, sense. Now, switching from the polystyrene foam, you know, clamshells to paper actually reduced waste uh, between 70 to 90 percent. And uh, of course, asking suppliers to incorporate, uh, McDonald's, what they did was they asked suppliers to incorporate 35 percent post-consumer recycled contents also in their shipping uh, boxes. And what they did was McDonald's managed to save over 100,000 tons of packaging annually. So that's the equivalent of 400 containers, okay? Avoided. Avoidance means, again, that's the top of the, uh, the pyramid. Uh, at the same time, they managed to save $6 million in the process. Uh, what's more, the burgers, believe it or not, actually tasted better in the cardboard because when you put a cardboard in a styrofoam clamshell, uh, the mist that came out of the burger condensated and went back into the burger, making it, you know, giving it a moist uh, uh, feel, whereas the cardboard actually sucks out all the uh, moisture. And so moving from styrofoam to cardboard led to happier customers. Not only that, it led to uh, less emissions, and it also led to, uh, like I said, $6 million of annual savings, which made the, the shareholders very, very uh, happy. So we're not saying you should pay money to save on the environment. We're saying you should find creative strategies that can actually uh, work together to, to serve the environment, the financial statements, and, and also potentially the community or your uh, other stakeholders. Now, one last thing I want to talk about, eight different strategies we can use to uh, reduce CO2. And the first uh, thing we should be aiming for is to set ourselves and set our uh, suppliers and our partners really uh, targets for carbon emissions. So do not leave it to chance. Uh, there are many resources out there today that assign a certain carbon emissions um, value to every single activity that we are engaged in. But if you don't measure it, you will not be able to manage it. So what you need to do as an exercise, if you're 
uh, going down that route is to first of all assess and analyze the carbon footprint of your organization, uh, put a number to it, and then from there try to reach generate savings year on on year to to reach the targets that you have set yourself. Uh, so that is going to pretty much give you a baseline for where you stand and where you uh, want to be. The next thing you can do is, of course, optimize your fleet operations, uh, drawing shorter routes. Uh, uh, you, you know, even if you're if you're shipping uh, people or if you're shipping uh, passengers, uh, you can have carpooling. You can uh, have more optimized uh, fle uh, vehicles in your uh, fleet, and all of that is going to save a lot of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, investing in greener production and warehousing facilities can, of course, generate uh, a lot of uh, uh, savings. So today's green facilities uh, extend everything from insulated walls that keep the, 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 the heating in or the cooling in, uh, all the way to capturing uh, rainwater and feeding it back into the system. Uh, smart, of course, uh, power and, and water uh, utility supplies to make sure that you keep waste to a uh, minimum. Uh, also, we have a responsibility to procure material from low footprint suppliers. So when you evaluate your suppliers, when you set them targets, don't just look at costs, not just look at delivery terms or, or specifications. You should also look at what they are doing to reduce their footprint. Because after all, uh, if they are partners uh, you know, in, in trade, then they are partners in everything else as well. And that covers uh, the environment. Uh, shifting always to a locally, uh, geographically located supplier will also uh, decrease the distance traveled. So that is going to as well generate a lot of uh, savings. Uh, designing products for, with more efficient life cycles. So trying to extend the uh, life cycle of your products instead of having, you know, uh, your, the, your product last a year, if you can make it last two years, then a lot of the emissions that are released from the, at the production stage can be uh, cut down. Incentivizing suppliers to reduce their emissions uh, as well. So again, when you are evaluating suppliers, don't limit your evaluations to uh, financials or, or quality of delivery. You should also provide bonuses or incentive plans for these suppliers to actually uh, cut down on their own emissions. And finally, uh, so we spoke about your supply side. Let's talk about the demand side as well. You can engage with, with customers to promote or to push the items that are actually uh, more environmentally friendly or the items that leave a lower footprint on the uh, environment. So that's basically uh, the today's topic. Thank you for uh, listening. Just to, to recap, we covered the CO2 emissions, and then we spoke about CO2 emissions in the context of supply chains, and we shared the eight different strategies for uh, CO2 reduction in your uh, supply chain. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please leave those in the chat pod, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer those. Sure, Ahmad will be sharing the uh, slides from the presentation with all of our participants. The webinar will also be posted on YouTube, so you'll be able to access the whole thing as well.